God's messengers as bringers of good tidings and warners so that mankind will have no argument against Allah after the messengers. And ever is Allah exalted in might and wise. But then Allah gave him the rulership back and he became the king again. And this time he was real careful. But he asked Allah for something. He said, Allah, I want something from you, Allah. Now, Allah likes when you ask him direct, by the way. It's okay. You can ask what you want. He said, I want a unique kingdom that you never gave to any prophet before and you'll never give to any prophet again. And Allah granted it for him. Now, that's a big responsibility, though. You know what Allah gave him? The ability to communicate with the animals and the birds and the insects. Remember that from before when we talked about that? Imagine this. Oh, yeah, he could. He could talk to them. Now, I've read a lot of children's stories about those animals, and birds and insects that he spoke to, and things that he told them. But some that we find in the Quran are really amazing. And it happened that at one point they became very strong in the military. By the way, he had animals in his military. He had no, I'm not joking. He had lions. He had tigers. He had birds in his military. Now, back then, that was pretty cool because, you know, they didn't have any kind of communication like we do. Like we have radios, cell phones, stuff like that. But he had birds, man. Those birds, he'd go, whoosh, whoosh, come back, give messages, deliver messages. And, of course, if you've got a lion on your side, even he had I'm coming to that. He had the jinn under his control, too. Not only could communicate with them, but Allah gave him power over them. Ah. Oh. And some of these jinn had been bad. They'd been telling people things, whispering in their ears. People can't see the jinn, but they hear voices, you know? And so these jinn were telling them things like, oh, look to the stars and get your magic here or there or look at this thing, it's going to help you, or that thing, or some other thing. Yeah, you know, because what they're thinking about, when people listen to that, they're thinking, oh, a shortcut. But the only shortcut there really is, you go to Allah and ask him. That's the only shortcut there is. But people look for other shortcuts, don't they? So this is what those jinn have been doing. So as part of their punishment, Allah let Suleiman have authority over them, and they had to obey they had to, or else uh, they'd be in trouble. Anyhow, so he had his big army, and they went into Ascalon, and that's in Palestine. And they took over, and they had this big, big place, a huge rock, giant rock. And Suleiman said, that's a good place to put a tent, right there. And he built that best temple that's ever been on this earth, ever. And people still talk about the temple of Suleiman today. It's the place of the Dome of the Rock, the same place called Dome of the Rock. You know where that one that we have now that belongs to the Muslims, that kind of like round looking? Okay, that's called Dome of the Rock, and that's the place, according to the story. Well, anyway, after he built that, he wanted to do Hajj. So he took some of his companions and he had a lot of companions, and they went to Mecca for Hajj. Now, back then, it wasn't like it is now. It was just in the desert. They went to the place in the desert. There was the foundation of it, you know, and they did their Hajj, and they were going to come back. And he decided, I'm going to go to Yemen. Do you remember Yemen? To a place called Sana'a. And when they got there, he looked around, and he saw something amazing. These people had their troughs set up, you know what a trough is? Water runs in it. And it's not a pipe because the top part's not covered. But they moved water from one place to another. And he was like, I like the way this works, the way the water moves here and there and it goes over there. I want that. That's good for us. So they all went back to Escalon and to Jerusalem. And when they got there, he was looking around and he said, you know, I'd like to build a boat. We don't have those springs. Those guys had water springs coming out of the ground. 
I got it. There's a bird that I know. He can find water. And I'm going to get him to come and help us find the water. Then we're going to move it all around. And this bird is called a hoopoe. You say that? Hoopoe. 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 Sounds Chinese, doesn't it? Hoopoe. Sounds like something you'd eat with chopsticks, you know. <laughs> anyway, so he started calling for the bird, and the bird didn't come. He waited, called again. Now, see, everything has to obey him because the law gave him that. That's the unique characteristic that he had. But they weren't obeying. You know, this bird wasn't coming. He was saying, hmm, hmm, hmm. He better have a pretty good excuse when he gets here or else we're going to have fried hoopoe tonight. You know? <laughs> he didn't say that. but just So when the bird came, he said, I know something you don't know. I said, what? He said, I saw something you can't imagine. There's a people, a group of people, and there's a woman ruling them. He said, so? And they have great wealth. Oh, yeah? She has a big throne. Oh, yeah? But there's something strange. He asked the bird, what's strange? He said, well, now this is a bird talking. Of all the things that Allah gave them, why is she worshiping the sun? He said, what? She's worshiping the sun? The bird said, yep. All the stuff that she's got, Allah gives her this and that. But they're all worshiping the sun. And she's got these guys around her, advisors, telling her this, telling her that. I said, okay, tell you what I want you to do. Listen to me. Take this letter, and you deliver it to her, drop it, and then go hide and watch what happens and give me a report back. Now, that's a good kind of military, isn't it? You got a bird working for you. And he took it. And the letter, which of course, it is going to be written like any prophet would write. What do you think it started with? In the name of Allah. Allah. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, or in Arabic? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And he said that it, who it's from? From Suleiman. And he was telling that she should come in submission. Her and her troops come and submission, because they had a big army. That was one of the things the bird was talking about. You know, you're talking about being able to see the armies coming. Well, that's what the bird had said, you know, a big army, they got a lot of stuff going on. So, but in the letter, the way he writes this, in Arabic, Aslama huh, is the root for Islam. And it means submission. It means surrender. It means give up. It means be sincere. And it means peace, salam. All of that is in this word. And it's always been like that. And that's what the word he was using. So she wasn't sure, what does he mean? Does he want me to surrender to him? But he means surrender to Allah. That's what he means when he says Islam or Aslama, Tasliman. Well, by the way, would you like to know something else about this? Yeah. The place called Jerusalem has this word in it. The word Jerusalem is very, very, very old. And once when I was in the university, we had a Jewish professor tell us about this. He said that it used to be called Dar Usalam. Dar Usalam. Jar Usalam after Dar Usalam. What does that mean? Dar Usalam means a place of peace. Dar es Salaam, Jar es Salaam, Jerusalem, place of peace. And it's got Salaam in it. You hear the Salaam, don't you? Salaam, Salaam. And he was saying that. If you read the letter in Arabic, you see he was telling them, be like Salaam when you come. But he meant, of course, to a law. Well, anyway, she said, okay, guys, what should we do? The advisor said, well, maybe he wants us to go to war. Maybe he wants, you know, he's challenging us. We should get some army together here, go over there, have a pretty good deal. We'll just go to war with those guys. He said, hold on a second. I don't like wars. It's not good. No good ever comes out of a war. Wars don't build. Wars tear down. And people get killed. And that's not the way to go. 
He said, instead, let's send some gifts. And they did. They sent treasures. They sent gifts. The best of the precious gifts they had in the land. And she sent an envoy. Uh, that means a bunch of people, okay, like in a caravan. And they went all the way from where they were in a place called Saba, all the way up there to Jerusalem. And when they got up there, they already knew they were coming. Why? Well, you know why. Because he's got his birds watching, got the jinn watching, and they kind of told him, those guys are coming. They're bringing some gifts and stuff. So the man said, okay, guys, front and center, everybody. Up where we go. We're going to have a parade drill today. And they brought everybody out. He brought out all of his army with their big, uh, you know, what do you call armor? Uh, they had everything on and their weapons out. Brought the uh, tigers and the lions. Brought everything out, even the birds, all of it lined up. So when those guys came, they went, <laughs> Pretty nice army you got. <laughs> Whoo! And we brought some gifts for you, and it's from the Queen of Sheba. She's sending this. Uh, her name is Bill Keese. And look what Suleiman did. He didn't even touch the treasures, he didn't even look at it. He said, what Allah has given me is better than anything you have. Send it back. Whoa. They were going. He didn't even open it. It was the best treasure we ever saw. They didn't even look at it. I don't need your treasure. I don't need anything from you. Take it back. Allah has given me more than this. And the best thing is always to submit to Allah. Now, this is a lesson he's trying to teach them. Well, of course, they went back right away, and they're telling him, man, this guy turned it down. He didn't take anything. He didn't want any treasure. Well, this means something. It means if he didn't take it, then obviously either he doesn't want anything at all from you or he's planning on coming and taking everything. So, again, these guys are going, maybe we're going to have to go to war with this guy. She said, no, 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 no. I got another idea. She said, I'll go. They said, you're going to go? Yep, Queen's going to go herself. And she's getting ready to go. But guess what? <laughs> After she took off, Suleiman's spies came and told him and said, guess what? She's coming. He said, okay, you know that big throne that she has? He said, yeah, it's beautiful, it's this, it's that. He said, who of you, and he's talking to his jinn now. The jinn are sitting there with him. He said, who of you will bring her throne to me? And one said, I could go and get that and have it back before this meeting's over. So the man didn't say anything. He was sitting there, meaning that he wasn't satisfied with that answer. And one of them said, well, I can bring it before you can blink your eyes. Blink. Boom. And there it was. He was called Ifrat or Ifrit. Right there was that throne. So the man said, okay, disguise it up a little bit, set it over here, and we're going to see what we're going to see. Mm -hmm. So when she came, on the day she arrived, of course, there was a lot of pomp and circumstance, they call it, you know, parade thing. They've got all the armies out and everything. She's like, oh, my gosh, look at this. He really does have a big army, you know. And lions and tigers in the army? Amazing. Then, <laughs> when he was talking to her, he was seeing if she's really guided by Allah or not, if she's really wise or not. And she really was a good person, but she'd just been told the wrong information. Somebody just told her to worship the sun, and she believed it. She didn't know. Now, this is important for us to understand that when people are born, they don't know any better. They're innocent, totally innocent. But as they grow up, Whatever people teach them, that's what they're going to believe. They don't have any reason to doubt their parents and the people around them, do they? No. And somebody was telling everybody, worship the sun, worship the sun, and that's why she did it. So anyway, now here they come to this castle, the big uh, palace, actually, of Suleiman. And when she went into the palace, now can you imagine a beautiful palace? Can you imagine 
how big are the columns can you see in your mind how is the beautiful top and this thing and look look across the tiled floors and walking through there and hearing the echo of your feet walking clickety clackety click and as they went through you know they came to this one room that he had and this is what he had set up he was waiting because there was water but there was glass over the top of it and she'd never seen anything like that in fact most people then had never even seen glass but he had a big piece of this like you know big glass so when she walked in and she saw it she thought oh i'm gonna get my feet wet so she lifted up her skirt like this way you know and started to walk in and then when she stepped on it this is glass oh she realized then exactly what a lot of us have to realize in our life sometimes i can be wrong i could think something is this but it could actually be something else and that's when it started clicking in her brain that some things are not right in my life now watch what happened next he told her come on in over here okay now he's got a throne but there's another throne he said what do you think about this throne over here she said oh it's it's uh, it's it's just like my throne he said oh, is it now she said well sort of she wants to be real careful she wants to be careful not to say that it is her throne because then that would be accusing him of stealing, right? Plus, how could it be her throne? How could it be up here? Because it was back home when she left. But it's my throne. I know my throne. Even they did some stuff to it, but still, that's it. And that's what she's thinking. She said, it's just like my throne. Suleiman, let her understand, it is yours. Huh? How'd I get here? The more she began to understand, this is not just a normal man. He's a prophet, a real prophet of Allah. And he has miracles, and that's one of the miracles. Allah guided her. She stopped worshiping the sun. She began worshiping Allah, and all of her people with her began worshiping Allah, too. They were believing in the God of Adam, Abraham, Moses, Jacob, and the tribes and this is the only god to believe in allah so that's that was a good deal for her to go there visit and she got a lot more than she bargained for because all the treasure in the world all the palaces in the world are worthless compared to the guidance of allah for instance when david died and suleiman inherited from him it's clear that what he got from his father is better than what we could get from our fathers. No matter how much money your father has, when he dies, he could leave you big wealth, but it would only be from this earth. But when a prophet dies, he doesn't leave any wealth at all for his children. Do you know that? When prophets die, whatever belongs to them in this world is never given to their family. It's given to charity. So what was it Suleiman got from his father that was worth so much? Wisdom. 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 That's one of the many things he got. Knowledge. Knowledge, yes. What else? Guidance. Guidance, Guidance. exactly. The guidance from Allah is the biggest and best gift of all. Because if Allah guides you, then nobody's going to misguide you. But if Allah doesn't guide you, then you're not going to be guided. Simple as that. And that's well known. Now, as Suleiman got older, another miracle happened. He had these mines where the people would go down in the mines and work and pull out, you know, valuable things in the mines. They used to get metals out of there and work the metals up and do stuff with it. Some said he even had diamond mines. They had a lot of things underground. And he had gin working for him constantly working and working and doing this and doing that and doing stuff and they were afraid to stop so much so that when he died he was leaning on his stick he died he didn't fall over because he was sitting there you know his stick they kept on working 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 they some people said for days 
Some said for weeks. Some said even for years. Yet they just kept working, working, working. Now, a prophet's body also does not decompose. Like anybody else's body, when they die, it, you know, <laughs> gets bad. Not prophets. So he's there, these sticks, not moving. But they kept working, working, working. Till one day, an ant, the kind that eats wood, started eating the bottom of his stick. And when he got up so far, the stick broke. And he fell over. And when he fell over, everybody rushed to him to see why he fell over. When I got there, he said, he's dead. He's been dead a long time. And that's when the jinn really realized how bad off they were. Because remember, they used to tell people. They knew the unseen. They knew things that other people didn't know. They used to give whiswats and whisper in people's ears and say all this stuff to them, you know? But if you knew anything, how come you didn't know he was dead and you kept on working? <laughs> Pretty good, huh? But Allah has ways of showing people what he wants them to know. He has ways of punishing people. He has ways to reward them. And these stories that we have of the prophets help us to understand a lot about our own lives and why we're here and what to do about our mistakes. Best thing to do is to know there really is a law. And when you make a mistake, go to a law, repent to a law, and ask him to forgive you. And have good hope that he will forgive you and don't ever do it again. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. When we think about the prophet Dawood, David, how much he really loved the law. He loved to be alone. He liked to go out. Remember, he started out as a shepherd when he was young. And then his father let him go to the army just to be there with his brothers, but not to fight. But he's the one that wound up killing the big one, didn't he? But even then, he wasn't trying to be a fighter. What he was trying to do is please the law. Remember what he said when he threw the rock at the big one. He told him, because you insulted the God of Israel. You've insulted Allah. That was the main thing that he was talking about. The thing that these prophets were uh, really keen on was to please Allah. And whatever they did, it was for Allah, not for themselves. The wealth that Suleiman had the, and the power that he had, it wasn't for himself. It was to use to benefit the believers of that time, to help them and to help them understand to worship a law. In fact, remember what happened when he started liking something for himself was the horses. Hmm? He liked them so much. He got distracted, forgot his prayers, and then he didn't like them anymore after that. He'd rather be worshiping a law. And that's the thing that all of us need to do is to worship a law more and to know why. So that's why we have programs like this. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. Well, till next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah.